The purpose of this program is to explain the basic functions of the hydrocyclic gearbox and the LVS45 control system, and to demonstrate to you the fault diagnosis procedure that can be carried out using very basic test equipment, consisting of a 24-volt test lamp, a hydraulic pressure gauge, and a test meter. By using this equipment, together with an overall knowledge of the basic functions, it will enable you to identify many of the faults quickly and efficiently. This transmission system is fitted in many vehicle types within the Leyland bus range. The Royal Tiger Doyen, Tiger, Leyland National and the Olympian. Whilst all the tests in the program will be conducted on an Olympian, the principles involved can be applied to many of these models and the notes that accompany this program contain the details of the component location for each of the vehicle types and the flowcharts for fault diagnosis. Before proceeding with the diagnosis procedures, let's look briefly at the basic operating principles involved. The hydrocyclic gearbox in most applications contains five forward gears and a reverse. In the case of the reverse gear, it also provides a retarder function. Each of the gears are actuated by hydraulic oil pressure, which is supplied by a pump which is gear-driven from the flywheel. The oil flow to each gear is controlled by individual electrical solenoids contained in an electro-hydraulic valve block. On the output shaft of the transmission, a transducer is fitted which monitors the vehicle road speed. In general terms, a vehicle fitted with the LVS system can be driven by simply manually selecting the required gear. However, there are certain inhibitors fitted to protect the engine and gearbox. For example, if the vehicle is stationary, the control panel will only allow first, second, third or reverse gear to be selected. Fourth and fifth gears are only available for selection after the vehicle is moving and the panel is receiving a speed signal from the transducer. Downshifts are normally selected as required. However, if a lower gear is selected at too high a road speed, the control panel will not allow the down change to take place until such time as a safe road speed is reached, preventing an engine overspeed condition. Let's look at an extreme example. If the vehicle was being driven at speed in fifth gear and first gear was selected, then the vehicle would only down sequence through the gears, fourth, third, second, and to first, as the road speed decreased. There are other control and inhibitors within the panel, but these will be covered in detail later in the program. Let's now look at the basic oil system. The gearbox is fitted with two oil pumps. This one supplies the retarder for cooling purposes, which will be dealt with later in the program while the other produces the oil pressure to operate the gearbox pistons. Both pumps are gear driven from the flywheel on the engine. When the engine is started, oil is drawn from the sump of the gearbox and then passes through a filter to the electro-hydraulic control within the EH block. Within the EH block, there is a pressure relief valve which controls the maximum operating pressure for the system. In most applications, this is 130 pounds per square inch. However, when engines of the higher power range are used, this operating pressure is increased. A table to cover these variations is included within the training notes. Oil then passes from the EH block to supply the charged flywheel. When oil is passed from the flywheel, it passes down the center of the running gear in the gearbox to lubricate the epicyclic gearing and clutch plate mechanism in the gearbox before once more returning back to the sump. The location of the transmission control system varies according to the model type. And although this program only deals with the Olympian, details of the other main variants are contained within the program notes. On the Olympian, there are two main locations for the control panel. Here, at the top of the main staircase, the panel is housed within the front junction box. And here is an alternative location under the stairs. And in this case, the transmission fuses are also located in the front junction box. 
The remainder of the controls are mounted at the rear of the vehicle. Here is the electro-hydraulic valve unit containing the gear operating solenoids, hydraulic valves and restrictors. And at the front is the pressure relief valve. The transducer is here on the gearbox, monitoring the vehicle road speed from the output shaft. And this is the retarder operating cylinder, the retarder solenoid, and the modulator valve to control the retarder pressure. And finally, the direction valve, which enables both reverse gear and the retarder to use reverse as required. And here are the two solenoids for first and second stage retarder operation. On the driver's dash panel, there is a lock-up warning light, which illuminates if there is a sudden loss of speed signal from the transducer. If the vehicle is in any forward gear, and this loss occurs, selection of any other gear will cause the panel to lock the transmission into fifth gear. This loss of speed signal could be either due to heavy braking or a fault. If the loss of speed signal is due to heavy braking, the control panel can be unlocked electrically by passing the controls through a normal start sequence. Switch off the engine, place the change speed in S and restart the engine. The light should then go out and normal gear selection will be available. On the control panel, there is an inspection window through which can be viewed the panel warning light. Under normal conditions, this light is out at all times. However, if the panel detects an electrical overload, due, for example, to a two-gear selection, the light will be on and the panel will place the transmission in neutral. This condition will remain until the problem has been corrected. The panel has two separate plug connectors. And for identification purposes, if we assume the unit is viewed from a horizontal position with the inspection window at the left, the plugs looking down from the top right hand side are S and G. Basically, the S plug carries the power supply and change speed input signals, and the G plug all the outputs from the panel to the gearbox solenoids. Now that we have a basic understanding of the transmission system, let's look at a number of fault conditions and the logical approach that should be made to find the faulty component. To help you do this, have the program Fault Charts available as a reference. Let's first look at no drive in one gear, for example, third. The items that would cause this are a third gear switch fault, a wiring fault between the change speed and the control panel, a panel fault, a wiring fault between the panel and the EH block, a fault either in the third gear solenoid, an electrical or hydraulic fault in the EH block, or finally, a fault in the third gear brake band. Now let's look at these faults in more detail. Our first check is to find whether the fault is in the controls or in the gearbox. This can be accomplished by unscrewing the plug under the third gear solenoid. This is located on the bottom of the EH block, and you will note that there are two rows of plugs. This row is the restrictors, and this the solenoid plugs. Unscrew the third gear solenoid plug until three threads are showing, and with the engine running, check for gear engagement. If all is correct in this area, the engine revs will reduce slightly as the gear engages. Had the problem been on second gear, there is a special facility on the top of the EH cover to engage second gear. This is done by taking out the screw and replacing without the washer. The screw will then push down the solenoid manually. If the gear engages, we have confirmed that the problem is within the controls and our next check is to remove the S-plug on the control panel and with the change speed in third, connect a test lamp between the A and L sockets. If the bulb fails to light, 
the fault is either in the change speed third gear switch or in the associated wiring to the S-plug. On the assumption that the bulb test was in order, the electrical supply plug to the EH block on the gearbox should be removed and again apply a test lamp, this time to the C and G connections. No supply here would indicate a wiring or a panel fault. If on the other hand the supply had been correct, the problem must either be in the third gear solenoid or in the wiring within the EH block supplying the solenoid. If we now go back to our first test, where we unscrewed the solenoid plug and the gear had not engaged, we must check the cylinder pressure by unscrewing the restrictor plug, which is in the row nearest to the gearbox. Replace with a gauge test plug, but ensure that the restrictor and spring do not fall out. Again, start the engine and check the pressure reading, which should be 130 pounds per square inch. Let's look at a diagrammatic view of these components to help you understand the principles involved. This is the EH block containing the solenoid, the solenoid hydraulic valve, the restrictor valve, and the operating cylinder and brake band. The solenoid, when it's energized, moves the solenoid hydraulic valve down, which initially allows the oil to flow from the main pressure gallery to the restrictor. The restrictor initially is in this position, which is a full flow condition. Oil continues on to supply the piston. When the cylinder is filled with oil, the pressure will rise, moving the piston upwards like this and applying the gear. As this pressure rise takes place, the restrictor is moved upwards to a position where it restricts the oil flow. This latter arrangement is to ensure that the brake band is applied slowly to give smooth gear acceptance in the final stages of application. There are a number of points to observe at this stage. When we took our pressure reading, it was here on the restrictor plug. The reason for this is that it's possible if there is a high cylinder leakage rate past the piston seals for the pressure on an individual cylinder to be lower than the main gallery pressure. When the restrictor is in operation, this high leakage rate past the piston seals will reduce the pressure in the cylinder and cause slip or a no drive condition, depending upon the degree of pressure drop. If we now go back to our third gear fault diagnosis path, because there is no independent means of operating the solenoid, as for second gear, apply third gear manually. Release the plug under the third gear solenoid until approximately three threads are showing, which will allow the solenoid valve to drop down, like this, and apply the gear. This method can also be used for any other gear to check the mechanism and hydraulics for that gear. Before we move away from this area, you should be aware that it's possible to fit the restrictor and its spring upside down, and also the solenoid valve. In addition, these two items can be interchanged and cause many fault conditions which are outlined in the program notes. The restrictor valves in some of the gears in the gearbox are different. Therefore, do not mix these components, and these are the identification grooves. Finally, remember that when retightening any of these plugs, do not over-tighten them in excess of 15 foot-pounds, because over-tightening will cause distortion to the valve liner and may cause the valve to jam. Let's now continue with the third gear fault path on the assumption that it still fails to engage. You'll be required to remove the gearbox lid and check the brake band and its adjustment. If you inspect the thread on the pull rod in relation to the nut, this will indicate the brake band lining condition related to wear. When the brake band is new, the rod is almost flush to the top of the nut. But when approximately three-eighths of an inch is protruding, the lining is approaching the end of its effective life.
On the assumption that the lining is serviceable on third, then check the adjustment. Temporarily replace the gearbox lid, start the engine, release the solenoid plug on fifth gear on the EH block, which will apply fifth gear, and so hold the running gear stationary to avoid oil splashing. Remove the gearbox lid and apply third gear. With the brake band applied, the brake band adjustment can be checked by placing a special gauge between the adjuster table and the brake band. This measurement is correct, and here is an example of over-adjustment of the brake band, and the cause of this is that the striker screw has been set out too far. This is another example. Here, the problem is one of under-adjustment, and there will be a number of causes for this condition. It could be that the striker screw has been set too far in, or the striker plate may be binding on the adjuster nut. The adjuster nut may be tight on the pull rod thread, or the adjusting spring may have been incorrectly fitted or broken. It can be rather confusing when replacing these adjuster springs, as it's very easy to fit them incorrectly, and they should be installed in the following manner. First, position the central single arm of the spring on the pillar of the striker plate and push the centre of the coil down to the collar of the nut. Then position the arm of the spring with the double eye securely at the top of the same pillar. And finally, place the remaining arm here on the pillar of the adjuster table. Before replacing the adjuster nut and its assembly, check that the striker plate doesn't bind when the assembly is complete. Clamp it to the striker plate between your fingers, like this. Any restriction here would cause a malfunction on the automatic adjustment. Positioning of these components can then be carried out as a commencing exercise in the manual setting of the automatic brake band adjustment mechanism. Always ensure that the adjuster nut runs down the pull rod thread freely. Now, with the mechanism in position and using this special spanner, tighten the brake band in order that it may become centralised on the brake drum. When the band is fully down, take the adjuster nut back three half turns. This will provide you with an approximate position for the start of the band adjustment setting sequence. Before proceeding, release the lock nut on the striker screw and screw it in. Then, with the engine running, apply third gear and check the distance between the brake band and the adjuster table. In this instance, the gap is too wide. Therefore, release the gear and turn the adjuster nut only slightly in an anti-clockwise direction. This will allow the table to come closer to the brake band on the next application. Now, check the gap once more. When the gauge just supports itself between the adjuster table and the brake band, the setting is correct. With the gear applied, it is now time to bring the striker screw back until it slightly deflects the striker plate, like this, and tighten down the lock nut of the striker screw. It is this striker screw that sets the degree of automatic adjustment that will take place. It is at this stage that we carry out a procedure to check whether the automatic adjuster is working correctly. To do this, place a reference mark on the striker plate in line with the slots on the nut. Then release the gear and release the main adjuster nut one quarter of a turn and refit the adjuster spring. The gear should now be cycled on and off, like this. You will notice that the gear only adjusts when the gear is on the release stroke. This cycling exercise must be carried out until the nut appears to have stopped adjusting. Operate the gear a further six times to be certain that the automatic adjustment has stopped. If the slots on the adjuster nut have stopped short of the reference mark, then the striker screw is not out far enough. If the slots of the screw go beyond the reference mark, then the reverse is the case. The striker screw is too far out and must be moved in. In either case, the condition should be corrected satisfactorily before once more replacing the gearbox cover. Remember, fifth gear has been manually applied. 
so before returning the vehicle to service, retighten the plug to the correct torque to release the gear. If the fault has been the loss of fourth or fifth gear, you can still carry out the input checks from the change speed to the S-plug on the control panel and also manually apply each of these gears by lowering the solenoid plug on the EH block. But due to inhibition circuits on the control panel, you cannot carry out the bulb test on the EH plug, as in third gear tests, unless an oscillator is used to feed the panel with a speed signal. If the fault had been no drive in first, second, third or reverse, the fault can either be electrical in the power supply to the panel, the panel itself, a transducer or wiring fault, or it could be mechanical, the main oil pressure supply failure, a gearbox seizure or failure, a final drive seizure or failure, or the braking system may have failed to release. Now start the engine and check to see whether the engine revs freely or labours. This will tell you whether you have a stall no drive or a neutral no drive condition. If the engine labours and only reaches approximately half revs, this will confirm the stall no drive. And in this instance, you should check the transmission lockup light on the driver's dash panel. If the light is on, put the change speed in S and turn the ignition switch off and then on again. This operation, providing there are no other problems, will unlock the control system for normal operation. Should the light remain on after this procedure, then a check must be made on the gearbox transducer and its associated wiring. To do this, remove the G-plug from the panel and using a meter, take a reading on the B and C pins. The reading should be in the region of 600 to 800 ohms, but should there be no reading, disconnect the transducer cable at the transducer and conduct the same test. If there is still no reading, then the transducer is faulty, but if correct, then there is a wiring fault between the panel and the transducer. If we now go back to the warning light check and it had been off, you should check the vehicle braking system. There may be a condition where the spring brakes have not released, but should this check be in order, then there must be some form of mechanical seizure in the gearbox or in the final drive. If, during our initial running of the engine, the engine had revved freely, then we would have had a neutral no-drive condition. So our first task is to decide whether the problem is in the gearbox or the control system. With the engine running, a quick check can be made on the gearbox oil pressure system by removing the spacer on the screw above the second gear solenoid. With this screw fully in, the engine revs will drop as second gear engages and as a final check, with the vehicle brakes on, accelerate the engine and if all is in order, then the engine can only reach half revs and achieve a stall condition. But if the engine still revs freely, then there are four possible causes for this. Oil pump failure, oil pump drive failure, a fault in one of the pressure relief valves in the EH block, or a failure in the final drive. If the final drive is in order, then we should first look at the pressure relief valves. In this instance, they should be removed, checked for damage, cleaned, and then replaced. By installing a pressure gauge at this point on the EH block, an accurate reading can be taken. This should be 130 pounds per square inch. If there is no pressure or a very low reading, check the pump and the drive on the engine flywheel. Reverting back to when we screwed in second gear, if the gear had engaged, this would tell us that the gearbox was operative and that our problem was within the control system. 
So the first stage in this situation is to check whether the control panel light is on. If the light is on, then the panel may be indicating a two-gear situation. To eliminate the solenoids and wiring in the EH block, disconnect the cable plug on the EH block, and having completed this, take the controls through the start sequence. If the light goes off, your fault is in the solenoids or its internal wiring. However, if the light remains on, the panel and its associated wiring to the EH is suspected. Moving back to the control panel light, if this had been off when making the original inspection, the S plug on the control panel must then be removed and a check made with the test lamp for supply on sockets A and C. If the supply is in order, this points to an internal control panel fault, but if no supply is evident, check the transmission fuses in the front junction box. If the fuses have blown, disconnect the foot brake retarder switches on the cannon connector at the front of the vehicle and replace the fuses with the S-plug still disconnected. If the fuses remain intact when the ignition is switched on, reconnect the S-plug and again check the fuses. If the fuses blow in this condition, then there is a problem within the panel. But if the fuses have blown before reconnecting the S-plug, this would point to a fault in the change speed control. And finally, if the fuses blow when the retarder is operated, then the fault lies in the foot brake switches or in the retarder solenoids, details of which will be covered in the retarder section of this program. If slip in all gears is evident during full throttle up changes, it will be necessary to carry out a pressure check on the main EH valve block gallery. The oil pressure should be 130 pounds per square inch. However, to give a slip condition, it would have to be as low as 40 to 50 pounds per square inch. If a low pressure is found, you should remove the two pressure relief valves for cleaning and inspection. Should the pressure still be too low after this, it'll be necessary to remove the main oil pump and check both it and its drive. By removing this plug and inserting an Allen key, minor adjustments to the main operating pressure can be made. Turn clockwise to increase pressure. And anti-clockwise to reduce pressure. If there is a sudden loss of gears and the vehicle is locked into fifth gear, this can be caused by a sudden loss of speed signal from the transducer causing the panel to go into a lock-up condition. The panel is designed so that when this signal loss occurs and the vehicle is in third gear or above, it will lock into fifth gear. This can be caused if the road wheels are suddenly locked due to an emergency braking condition, causing the sudden collapse of the signal to the panel. This condition will be indicated on the driver's dash panel. Providing the signal failure was not due to a fault, the transmission can be unlocked by passing the controls through a start sequence. If it's found the vehicle has an intermittent loss of gears, this can be caused by excess clearance on the gearbox transducer. If the clearance is too wide, there can be a sudden loss of speed signal, particularly at the higher road speeds, causing the panel to lock up. A check should be made to the wiring, connections, and to the resistance of the transducer, as previously explained. If this condition of lockup only arises when the foot brake is pressed, this would point to a problem of a special suppression diode fitted to the retarder EP units. These units can be isolated by disconnecting the cannon connector at the front of the vehicle, which will effectively isolate or stop the operation of these EPs. So if the vehicle functions correctly without the retarder switches or EPs in operation, and then fails only when they're reconnected, this points to a problem within the retarder diodes. These can be checked by first releasing the center screw on the EP unit and pulling the cable through to expose the diode. 
This should now be checked with a meter. Measure the resistance of the diodes in both directions. One direction should be fairly high and in the other, low. If incorrect, the diode probably is not suppressing the EP unit and may cause an electrical disturbance to the main control panel. If the transducer has to be replaced or reset, there must be a 5 to 25 thou clearance between the transducer tip and the toothed gear wheel. This can be checked by placing the transducer in the gearbox in with no shims and then checking with feeler gauges the distance between the probe flange and the gearbox casing. Then a shim should be added equal to the feeler gauge thickness plus the 5 to 25 thou clearance of the probe. Before proceeding with retarder fault diagnosis, let's first look at its basic operating principle. There are three switches which are triggered by operating the foot brake. Initial movement of the pedal operates switch A, which passes a signal to the control panel in order to decide whether the vehicle is in the correct mode to allow retarder operation. For example, the vehicle must be travelling forward at a speed in excess of two to three miles an hour before operation of the solenoid is allowed by the panel. This allows oil pressure from the main system through to the modulator valve. Further application of the foot brake operates switch B, which energizes the first stage EP unit of the retarder. From this point, air is allowed through the first stage section of the retarder air cylinder, which in turn operates the modulator valve and allows oil from the main oil system in the gearbox to act on the retarder operating piston. The second stage of the foot brake now becomes operative with further pedal movement. However, before we can operate the second stage of the EP unit, the signal passes through the control panel. Should the vehicle be travelling at a speed approximately 35 miles an hour or more, or be in a gear lower than third, the panel will not allow the second stage to operate. Under normal circumstances, when the second stage EP is energised, air is passed to the remaining section of the air cylinder, which causes the modulator valve to move further and allow higher pressure to the reverse gear or retarder piston, thus increasing the degree of retardation. This upper second stage cutout of 35 miles an hour is an average figure depending on vehicle applications and axle ratios, but note this does not apply to current models. Retarder cooling is accomplished by means of a second oil pump in tandem with the main oil pump. Oil is drawn from the gearbox sump and passes through a heat exchanger which is coupled to the radiator cooling system. From this point, the oil passes to the retarder section and puts a large quantity of oil, 24 gallons per minute, onto the plates to cool them during the retardation function. In coach operation, there are two areas that differ. The first is that the retarder can be operated by a two-stage hand-operated switch. And secondly, the gearbox incorporates an oil temperature switch, which will trip out the second stage retarder operation if the gearbox oil temperature reaches 125 degrees centigrade. The driver has a dash warning light that the temperature has cut the second stage out. For the retarder fault diagnosis and testing, the only part of the retarder which will operate while the vehicle is stationary by applying the foot brake is the first stage air cylinder. Therefore, in order to operate the retarder circuit in the panel, the retarder solenoid and the second stage air cylinder, we would have to apply the following procedures. As we must introduce a speed signal to trigger the panel, this can be done by means of an oscillator connected to the transducer lead by the gearbox. Then, the change speed must be placed in third gear or above in order for the second stage to operate and the foot brake be operated, fully triggering all three of the micro switches. Should an oscillator not be available, there is an alternative method by using the vehicle's own transducer, which is by jacking up the vehicle and suitably supporting the rear wheels and chocking both front wheels. Then, 
as the foot brake switches will need to be operated and in order that the foundation brakes do not stop the rear wheels rotating, the rear brake service supply pipe must be disconnected and plugged. Now start the engine, release the handbrake and place the change speed in third gear. Then apply the foot brake and accelerate the engine to half revs. If the retarder is operating correctly, the first and second stage operation of the retarder cylinder will be seen. Now, install a pressure gauge on the retarder modulator valve at the rear of the vehicle. Start the engine and place in third gear. If the foot brake is now applied slowly in stages, the first movement will operate the retarder solenoid. The next stage will operate the first stage cylinder and you should then have a pressure reading of 16 pounds per square inch. Then the final movement will operate the second stage and the pressure reading should now be 27 pounds per square inch. If both these readings are correct and the twin actuator is moving, all is in order for the basic operation of the retarder. As a final check to ensure that there is no excessive piston leakage or damage to the retarder plates, engage reverse gear. As this is fed through a restrictor, any piston leakage or damage to the plates will be detectable. With the handbrake on, accelerate the engine, and if it reaches approximately half revs, a stall condition, then this is a reasonable indication that the retarder plates and operating piston are in order. As a final maintenance check, it's important to measure the residual pressure in the retarder system. This can be done by running the engine and operating the retarder solenoid by hand. The pressure should be zero to three pounds per square inch. If it's higher than this, the modulator valve requires to be stripped and re-shimmed, details of which are contained in the program notes. Although a high residual pressure is not detrimental under normal circumstances, should the retarder first or second stage solenoid or foot brake micro switch stick, this can cause the retarder to be partly operative to a level approaching the first stage retardation while the vehicle was being driven normally, causing an apparent loss of engine power. If when carrying out these tests, there was no reading on the pressure gauge on the retarder and reverse gear engages correctly, check if the air cylinder moves. If there is no movement, the cylinder may have seized or be leaking badly or there is a failure in the air supply from the auxiliary tank to the first and second stage EP units. But if there was no pressure, yet the air cylinder was operating, the fault could be in the electrical supply to the foot brake switches, the solenoid switch in the foot brake or a fault in the retarder circuit of the panel or either an electrical or hydraulic fault in the retarder solenoid. Let's look at these checks in more practical terms. If there's a fault condition where the first and second stage retarders are not operating, we should first check that there is a pressure reading. If there is no pressure, we should first engage reverse gear. If reverse gear does not engage, this would indicate most definitely a problem with the retarder piston seals and must be corrected. If on the other hand, reverse gear does engage, this would indicate that all is in order in that area. The next stage will be to observe the movement of the two-stage air cylinder to see whether the first and second stage move. If there is no movement taking place, this would point to an air supply problem, possibly due to no air being in the auxiliary tank, which supplies both first and second stage EP units. If again we have no movement, we should then refer to the panel and ensure that the foot brake is sending the appropriate solenoid signal to the control panel. This can be done by removing the S-plug and carrying out a bulb test to the connectors R and A on the plug. If the supply is correct, 
you should move to the rear of the vehicle, remove the cover on the retarder solenoid and operate it and the air cylinder manually. If there is no pressure reading when this is done, it would point to a problem in the solenoid hydraulic system or the retarder direction valves. If there was a pressure reading when the retarder solenoid was operated, you should turn your attention to the electrical supply feeding the retarder solenoid. This can be carried out again with a test lamp on the supply plug, which is close to the solenoid. If no supply was present, it would indicate a wiring fault from the panel to the solenoid or the panel itself. But if there was a supply, a solenoid fault would be apparent. If on your maintenance check you found that the first stage cylinder was not operating, one of the simplest checks to do is to connect the second stage EP unit to the first stage EP. This can be done by simply removing the single screw in the cover of each plug and changing them over. If when this is done you still do not have movement, it would indicate that the first stage EP unit was at fault and therefore should be changed. If we revert back and find that you had no movement when you carried out that test, it would tell you that the EP unit was operating and you should then conduct a check on the first stage output switch from the foot brake. This can be done quite conveniently on the two pin connector which will be found close to the control panel and the wire interconnects the S and G looms. A simple bulb test will confirm whether you had supply or not. If there was no supply, this would indicate a fault either within the foot brake switch or in the wiring from the foot brake. But if the supply was in order, you would then be required to check all wiring connections to the first stage EP unit. If you found the first stage operating correctly, but this time the second stage cylinder failed to function, you would have to carry out a similar test. In other words, connect the first stage EP across to the second stage. If then you had no movement, this would point to a problem within the second stage EP unit. If the air cylinder did move when this exercise was conducted, check the second stage foot brake switch input to the panel, and this is on the S-plug connections A and N with a test lamp. If no supply is available at this point, the foot brake switch for the second stage operation and the wiring must have a problem and must be checked out completely. If the supply had been in order, check all the wiring and connections from the panel to the second stage EP unit. In the case of vehicles fitted with a temperature switch, this should be checked at the same time, as a fault with this switch may have tripped out the second stage operation. If this is the case and the temperature switch is operative, it would then be accompanied by the warning light on the driver's dash panel lighting up. If all the items on this second stage retarder are correct, then we have a probable panel fault. If the retarder first and second stage operating pressure is incorrect, you're able to adjust the air operating cylinder for both stages. The procedure is, with the engine running and the retarder solenoid held down, connect an external air supply to both stages so they can be operated at random while adjustment is taking place. To carry out adjustment of the air cylinder, hold the cylinder and release the large lock nut. Now screw in to reduce the pressure or out to increase. When the operating pressure is correct, retighten the lock nut. In the unlikely event of you being unable to achieve second stage pressure, you'll have to re-shim the modulator valve internally, seen here in cross-section, details of which are in the training notes. The next check to carry out is the point at which the retarder operates in relation to the foot brake and the foundation brake air pressures. The retarder solenoid should operate when the foot brake has travelled down three millimetres. The first stage foot brake switch should trigger the retarder when there is zero pressure in the air brake chambers. Second stage should operate when the air pressure is nine pounds per square inch in the foundation brake. If this relationship is not available between the retarder and the air brake system, the switches within the foot brake should be inspected and readjusted as required.
Here are the three switches on the foot brake. Each switch has three screws and an Allen screw. The center screw and the Allen screw are responsible for adjusting the effective stroke of the micro switches. In practice, these should not normally need touching. The screw at the top and the screw at the bottom, when slackened, enable each individual switch assembly to be slid to adjust the point at which the switch is triggered by the operating step in the foot brake valve. If there is complete electrical failure or a fault on the control panel and you're required to move the vehicle, second gear can be engaged manually by removing the small sleeve on the screw on the top of the EH block and replacing the screw fully until it contacts with the second gear solenoid. The operation of this will move the solenoid down and engage second gear. However, before you move the vehicle, disconnect the wiring to the EH block to isolate the change speed control to avoid any possibility of making a two gear selection. If the road conditions are suitable and a higher gear is required, as in the case of long distance recovery, it's possible to unscrew the plug under number three or four solenoid in the EH valve block. This will allow the solenoid plunger to drop and engage that particular gear. As an alternative to this, remove the solenoid valve and refit upside down. The retaining plug can then be replaced and fully tightened. This action will give continuous gear application to that gear. If you have the loss of one gear and the problem has been identified as the piston seal, remove the restrictor valve for that particular gear and place a small distance piece or bolt on the top of the restrictor valve before replacing it. This effectively cuts out the restrictor and keeps it in a full flow condition, which temporarily offsets the high leakage past that particular operating piston seal. If you have to tow the vehicle, for whatever reason, always remove the axle drive shafts. Failure to observe this will severely damage the gearbox. During all these tests, always ensure that the park brake is applied and the road wheels chocked where applicable. Where running tests are conducted, always make sure that the vehicle is not in a confined space. Before checking the gearbox oil level, you must always run the engine for at least three minutes before taking a reading on the dipstick. This is to ensure that the flywheel and all hydraulic components are charged with oil. Failure to observe this will result in the main gearbox oil level being too low. It should be noted that if a loss of gears is experienced when the vehicle corners, this is an early indication that the gearbox oil level is dangerously low. This condition must be corrected immediately to avoid damage to the clutch plates and brake band assemblies. This program has been designed so you can fault diagnose the transmission system with basic test equipment, namely a test lamp, pressure gauge and test meter. Inevitably, there will be a percentage of faults that will require in-depth expertise and specialised test equipment. Here, for example, is an oscillator which can feed a variable speed signal to the panel replacing the function of the transducer. A gear switch box which plugs into the EH block providing a convenient means whereby any gear or gears can be selected, enabling a quick check to be made of the basic operation of any gear or for brake band adjustment. A retarder switch box, which checks the operation of the retarder and the retarder foot brake switch sequence and setting. A harness tester, which can be substituted for the panel and which checks all the input wiring and controls, and also provides an output to check the output wiring and the gearbox control solenoids. Remember, when you're fault finding on this transmission system, your first task is to identify the fault category, then proceed to locate the fault condition within the area. Always ask yourself these basic questions. Is the panel receiving the right signal from the transducer and the change speed control? Is the panel sending the right signal? Is the signal arriving at the gearbox? Are the gearbox controls responding? And is the gearbox mechanically operational? By using this logical approach, you should be able to identify any fault condition which may occur quickly 
and effectively.